The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Coming up on the agenda. I think if you have um, a really good, firm idea of what sort of situations you're facing, and that might be there for pessimism, um, you're much more likely to be able to come up with a, a practical solution. Then, when we're under a lot of stress, when, when the world is being tough on us, these close connections we have allow us to sort of dissipate that, to share the stress, and to feel like somebody is there and somebody cares. That's ahead on The Agenda. The theory of evolution holds, roughly speaking, that over time, nature selects out the traits in a species that aren't helpful for it to succeed. Well, if so, why does something as not helpful, indeed often immobilizing and impenetrable as depression, continue to exist as part of the human condition? Let's get into that with, in Brighton, Michigan, Randolph Nessie, Emeritus Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Michigan and author of Good Reasons for Bad Feelings, Insights from the Frontier of Evolutionary Psychiatry. In Halifax, Nova Scotia, Marianne Fisher, Professor of Psychology at St. Mary's University in Halifax and an affiliate faculty member at the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University. And here in our studio, Paul Andrews, Professor of Evolutionary Psychology at McMaster University in Hamilton. And Paul, it's good to meet you and have you here in our studio. And to Randolph and Marianne and Points Beyond, thank you for joining us tonight as well. I want to start with a quote Great. from Inverse.com, which is an online magazine, covers all sorts of topics like technology, science, culture, mostly for a millennial audience. And here's what they say. Depression is an evolutionary conundrum. On the one hand, it's the leading cause of disability worldwide. On the other, the genes that give rise to it have been around at least as long as modern humans have walked the earth. That means it must play a role in our survival. Okay, Marianne, to you first. An evolutionary conundrum is how they describe it. How would you characterize it? I think it, it, it's very useful to think of depression as something that is just part of the human condition. And I do agree that it's been part of our evolutionary past. And to view it as something that is negative is just needless. So the conundrum really, I think, is being encapsulated in that quotation because it's, you know, we don't like to think of it as something that could be useful or has played an important role over our entire existence, but it is part of who we are. Just like being happy and sad and fearful and angry are part of who we are. So it's, it's a really mixed bag. Paul, how would you characterize it? Yeah, I really like what Marianne just said. Uh, I view depression as uh, an emotion like uh, many other uh, emotions. And what we know about um, painful feelings, painful emotions, is they all motivate us to avoid something harmful in our lives. If we uh, think about the pain that you feel when you have a, a sprained ankle, what it does is it motivates you to keep your weight off your ankle so you avoid further injuring it. Same thing with uh, fear, uh, jealousy motivates you to avoid uh, an infidelity, et cetera, et cetera. What does with, depression motivate us to do? That's, the, that's where the conundrum is, as, as I see it. It's been a puzzle for uh, many of us studying depression to figure out what it is that depression motivates, to us, motivates us to avoid. Um, uh, well, let me hold you off there, because sure, we're yeah, going to unpack yeah, yeah. that during the course Good. of our discussion. We'll get into, Randolph, I'll get you in here now. We're going to obviously get into different theories as we continue our conversation. But in your view, to what extent are we still unraveling the evolutionary mystery of why depression exists? Now, it's so wonderful to talk to my colleagues about this because we are right in the midst of trying to get this all straight. You know, everyone who studies depression has tried so desperately to find the bad genes or the spot in the brain or the neurotransmitter, and it's been disappointing. Everybody's calling for new directions, and I think we now really have one, and it's not something made up. It's the fundamental biological theory, and as Paul just said, um, we need to try to figure out why the capacity for low mood exists and why it's badly regulated sometimes, and just like he said, it's really mental pain. It seems like natural selection making us having no pain would be great. 
except sadly people who are born with no pain usually are dead by the time they're 30 or 40. Hmm. So you know, there are very useful ways, and it all depends on the situation you're in. The mystery, though, I think, is why the regulation mechanism gives us so much useless depression. All right, Paul, let's follow up on that. How does your work explain why depression exists? Um, my primary interest, uh, first of all, it's, it's important to know what we're talking about when we use the word depression. Uh, most everybody in the field understands that the word depression really applies to a collection of traits. They share sadness and the uh, loss of pleasure in common, but they differ in other uh, features. So for instance, when you get sick with an infection, that causes a type of depression. Uh, when you're starving, that also causes a type of depression. The kind of depression I'm interested in is probably one of the most clinically use, um, important ones, and that's ruminative depression. It's the uh, a depression that occurs uh, that causes you to think persistently about um, the problems that made you depressed in the first place, particularly the causes of those problems and the consequences of those problems. So that's just background for what it is that I try to study. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my research uh, is basically showing that depression, uh, rumination, these persistent thoughts, is, is a very useful thing. So uh, I have a good example of, uh, that will make intuitive sense to most of the viewers for how depressive rumination can be useful. Fire away. Okay, great. So let's imagine that uh, there's a physician uh, who has made a very serious medical error, perhaps has hurt his patient, maybe even killed the patient. Uh, most physicians, uh, if, unless they're psychopathic, would feel a lot of agony over this because their whole job is to try and help their patients. Now, errors happen within medicine. They happen, um, you know, almost every physician's gonna make a serious error at some point in their life. So anyway, they're gonna feel a lot of agony. Um, the agony will often uh, reach clinical levels. They'll show the features of depression, of anxiety, acute stress uh, reactions. And what are they um, feeling agony over? Well, they've hurt their patient. They uh, are worried about their careers, loss of reputation, possibility of um, uh, losing their license. Okay, now that agony motivates them to do something. What is it that they are motivated to do? Hopefully to do better. Exactly, actually what that's exactly what they're doing. They're trying to avoid making a similar mistake in the future. And so they go through a, an intense thought process that actually helps them make, uh, learn where they got things wrong and to do better in the future. Okay, let me take that and put it to Marianne, which is do you think that means that people People that are prone to depression are more likely to become intellectuals or thinkers. I do, and I, I really like Paul's answer there because we, we have to unpack, first of all, what we mean by depression, and I'm very glad that he took that stance because that also falls in line with uh, the work I've done. So we know that people with uh, low levels of depression, for example, tend to think very critically. They tend to break, break a big situation down into smaller um, maybe achievable steps even, which sounds a bit counterintuitive, but they're able to, to see things in a much more realistic manner. And they, they don't have that level of optimism that can be great in terms of how it feels, but it's also quite blinding. And so depression, at least in, in the forms Paul has discussed, might be very useful to make us think intellectually about a situation, break it down into those smaller, maybe more achievable steps as we ruminate upon how to solve those things, and maybe make some progress. Um, and so I, I really like that that sort of framework and I find that it fits well with the, the research overall, in my opinion. In terms of the second part of your question though, um, I think intellectuals, I think they do take those bigger problems and if they're gonna be um, you know, good at solving them, they have to break it down. And I think there is therefore that, that link between um, the, you know, the cognitive mechanisms underlying some forms of depression and maybe more intellectual routes of thinking. Randolph, let me come at this another way with you. Uh, evolution creates instincts that motivate us to do things to help our survival. Depression can lead to a lack of motivation entirely. So how would depression have been useful, evolutionarily speaking? 
A well put question. That puts your finger right on the conundrum, doesn't it? <laughs> and if, it's, if it stops you from doing things, how can that possibly be useful? But here's the way of looking at it. I mean, are there situations in which it's best to not take risks, not do things? And sure, there's lots of them. If you're in the middle of the winter, like my ancestors in an island in the North Sea, and the optimistic ones say, it's February, but I'm going to go out and find some food anyhow. I mean, those ancestors are no longer with us. Um, if you're trying to reply to school for the fifth time, you're probably wasting your energy. Um, there's a big difference between sadness, which is how we feel after a loss, and low mood and depression, which is what happens in a bunch of different situations, as Paul has emphasized, but especially when we're pursuing an unreachable goal. There's a whole sequence of unpleasant feelings that come up. For, first, you lose interest, and then you try a different strategy. If nothing works, uh, disengage motivation entirely and try something different. So when you're trying to do something that's pursuing an unreachable goal, uh, the best thing to do is try a different route, pause, wait, and if nothing works, quit. <laughs> Marianne, I see you nodding there. Can I get you to react to what you've just heard? Randy, that was so eloquent. It's, it's exactly that. You know, like um, I have a lot of students and when I teach about de depression and mood in my evolutionary psychology course, um, you know, a lot of them say that they want to have this fantastic occupation and they have this huge career goal and statistics show us that that is highly um, unlikely to put it politely. And so what we talk about is, yes, it's good to have that lofty dream. Why not? Right. But if you're going to waste all your time and energy and in pursuit of that dream and in the meantime, not get anywhere, um, that's, that's just not fruitful. And so we talk a lot about having, you know, plans A, which could be like the lofty dream, but then having plan B, C, D, and E. So you have your fallback plan, you have your less desirable plan, you have maybe your more achievable, immediate feedback, get some money in plan for occupations. And I just, I think it's so useful to think about, um, you know, that sort of balance point between that, that motivating spirit of, oh, you know, like in Canada, we want to do all these great things and have the best life ever. But what's actually achievable, you know? And I think if we set ourselves up for failure, we can't help but experience that devastation of a loss. So um, I just, I, I really appreciate that framework that Randy put in place there. Paul, does all of that fit with your view? Yeah, I mean, um, I do believe that frustrated goals are an important uh, trigger or cause of depression. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not sure that it encapsulates all the different causes of depression, but, but definitely I see a lot of um, commonality in thinking between Randy's framework and mine. So don't dream too big? Well, you know, of course, natural selection sometimes asks us to dream big. And, you know, if you don't dream big, you can never actually succeed big. It's just that, uh, you know, there a lot of stuff in life involves taking risks. And uh, if you're going to take risks, then sometimes you're going to, maybe a lot of times you're going to lose. <laughs> Randolph, let me get you to do a, sort of a um, evolutionary psychiatry 101 here with this. Depression can lead to social withdrawal. There's another theory based on observations of primates, we're told, that may explain this. So let's do that. What is social rank theory? A fellow named John Price, a wonderful psychiatrist in the UK, studied chickens, <clears throat> and he noticed that the chickens who lost a pecking order battle, who kept on fighting, got beat up really badly. And he pointed out that it was really best for those chickens to quit fighting. Then he did the same kind of study with monkeys, and he watched a monkey after it was taken out of a cage where it was with the females, and, and guess what? If it lost a battle and kept trying to fight, it got beat up pretty badly. So he came up with this idea of involuntary yielding, which which means um, thinking badly about yourself and excessively badly about yourself in order to you know, not keep on struggling in a status kind of conflict. And I think this is one of the situations that's very germane to depression. Marianne, do you think this applies to humans? I do. Um, my main area of research is women's competition with each other, so intersexual competition. And I think um, in light of all the recent news about social media, for example, and how women are, as young women especially, are beginning to feel um, a loss of position, right? So they're constantly ranking themselves amongst their friends or have those indirect mechanisms where they're judging themselves against others. Um, I, I do think that involuntary yielding is playing a significant role. Um, but I, I think the, the underlying part of that is still, you know, the evolutionary psychology of um, people trying to, to find the best mates possible, to form the best coalitions possible, um, and have the best prognosis for their own survival. 
I got to use a sports analogy here for Randolph because, and since you are uh, University of Michigan, the Detroit Red Wings never would have won <laughs> three Stanley Cups in six years in the 1990s with uh, the president of the Maple Leaf uh, Hockey Club as one of their star players if when the going got tough, the tough got going, if they just quit when things got too hard. So again, does this really apply to humans? So sometimes, actually, I refuse to do interviews uh, on public media because the, the interviewer will say, so doesn't your theory mean you should just quit? And of course, no. <laughs> um, the reason people, the reason this is also difficult is that there are good reasons why people don't quit pursuing some unreachable goal, like trying to get your kid off drugs or trying to help your spouse with cancer or trying to stop your own drinking. I mean, these are really poignant, intimate, deep life problems. And this is why, you know, any generalization doesn't work. I'd say the, the deepest generalization I come to, the you know, way that evolution makes things more useful is, let's use our understanding of why low mood exists to talk in depth for hours with people about the details of their lives to try to figure out why why it is they're stuck in some place instead of trying to have a simplistic solution. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you indulged me in that question anyway and that you're, you're going to stick with us for the rest of this, right? I, I, I agreed to stay on this show. I look forward to the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Okay. Uh, Paul, how about this? Depression does not exactly make you optimistic about the future. Is pessimism evolutionarily advantageous? Certainly can be. Uh, there's this concept in social and cognitive psychology called defensive pessimism. And it basically uh, involves uh, you take um, viewing uh, the future negatively so that you can prepare for uh, the a negative future by having backup plans. Like, oh, if the things don't work out the way I want them to do, I need to have a backup plan. That is called defensive pessimism. And that concept is is very adaptive and uh, and that certainly plays a role in uh the depressive states that i study as well yeah hmm. marianne where are you on this notion of defensive pessimism I, I haven't thought of it in terms of that um but i would say that I, first of all i'm an optimist so this is really quite amusing to me in a way because i, I believe in the goodness of people and all that great stuff but um Pessimism is very useful. You know, the, the rose-colored glasses have come off. You see things how they really are. And I think if you have um, a really good, firm idea of what sort of situations you're facing, and that might be there for pessimism, um, you're much more likely to be able to come up with a, a practical solution. So I, as I said, I, I haven't thought about in terms of defensive pessimism. I'm going to, I like that idea, but I do think that uh, pessimism often leads to much more constructive problem solving. Randolph, how about you on that? So most of us, like Marianne said before, are optimistic most of the time. And when, when we're in the midst of doing something that isn't working, at some point it becomes better to not be so optimistic blindly and to be more realistic about the options. While you have the floor, let me try this with you. There's a long list of great thinkers and artists who have suffered from depression over the years. Do you think there is a link between depression and creativity that would explain why it has persisted over our evolutionary history? So that's an open question scientifically that I look forward to other people um, continuing to pursue. On the other hand, if you look at how many people want to write a novel and how many people want to break into big time rock and roll and all the rest, it's lots and lots of people. And how many people keep going and keep going and keep going? Very, very few. The only people who actually make it to the top in many of these fields are the ones who fail over and over again and keep trying, 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 trying. And guess what? That's the kind of situation that makes it likely that you're going to be depressed. So it might be more direction the other way, where pursuing grand goals despite all kinds of obstacles, um, ends up causing depression. Um, and that's a, one reason why a lot of very creative, successful people are depressed. Hmm. Paul, can I get your take on that? Yeah, I like a lot of what Randy said there. I mean, um, the, the origin of the, the hypothesis that I uh, conduct research on really isn't a, a modern one. It's an ancient one. It goes back to the ancient Greeks. The idea, really, that um, depressive thinking is careful, methodical, analytical, and often creative. Uh, Theophrastus, who was a student of Aristotle, said that all great thinkers are likely to become melancholic. Hmm. Um, so, and, and really, it, it shows its greatest manifestation over history around the Renaissance. I mean, the, the classic play of Hamlet by Shakespeare um, 
uh, Shakespeare in that play plays with the two different ideas about depression. One, it's a mental disorder that disrupts your thinking, and also that it's a source of careful, methodical, scientific thinking. Hamlet in that play ends up using his depression to figure out how his, that his uncle actually uh, killed his father. Hmm. Uh, and, and Shakespeare is very clear about that. Anyway, so that idea of creativity and analytical thinking and being tied to depression has a real ancient history. Um, so while I agree with Randy, we should be doing a lot more research, I just want to point out that's an that's a idea in our culture that has existed for a long period of time. Mm. Mary Ann, do you want to weigh in on that? Hey, um both people have said something really useful here to me. So, um, you know, Randy's point that science still has a long way to go. Absolutely. I fully agree with that. Um, and I also, you know, I think it's important that we do recognize that culturally we've made that tie between like the tortured soul and uh, and great works of creativity. But I, I would say that, um, you know, being, being creative, I think, involves that uh, throwing risks to the wind and, and just going for it repeatedly and facing failure in most instances, repeatedly. And I don't see how that can lead to a happy state of feeling. It's just, you know, you, I think you'd have some low mood as a result of that constant um, feedback that it could be fail, uh, to do with failure. So um, all the points raised, I think, really have a lot of merit there. Well, I know we are sort of discussing, as the title of Randolph's book would suggest, that there are good reasons for bad feelings. But having said that, is there a danger here, and Randolph, maybe you could start us off in this, is there a danger here of missing the obvious fact that depression is still a very debilitating disease, and it is more often than not a bad thing? Can we say that? I'm so glad you brought that up, because some people mis misunderstand my point and imagine that I'm saying that depression is usually useful. Uh, I'm not. In fact, even when the mechanisms in the brain and psychology are normal, most depression is not useful, and there are complicated reasons for that. So there are two chapters in my book, one about depression being useful, and the other is called When the Moodostat Fails. And you know, a lot of people who have that depression, it really is a brain or psychological problem. It is a disease. So it's so important to try to make that distinction. I think you can only make that distinction, however, if you get into the details of a person's life as an individual, in addition to their genes, hormones, and all the rest. Paul, how about you on that? Well, you know, this is where Randy and I will probably uh, agree to disagree. Uh, I mean, that's allowed I, here. <laughs> it's allowed, <laughs> right? Good. Well, um, I believe, uh, along with many other researchers, that our current diagnostic criteria for depression uh, tends to pathologize many normal emotional experiences. Um, so, uh, I don't think that for most episodes of depression, even severe ones that last a long time, that there's anything really going wrong in the brain. Now, that doesn't mean that all episodes of depression produce adaptive or useful outcomes. But that's also true of just about every emotion. I think um, Marianne said that uh, earlier on in, the, in this talk. Um, you know, how many times do you know, we get angry and it gets us into trouble? Hmm. Or we experience unrequited love, which is almost by definition uh, a useless waste of time, right? Hmm. But those are all part of normal human experiences, and we don't need to invoke any sort of disorder narrative uh, for uh, explaining that. So do you see this more as disorder or as adaptation? I, I believe most of it is adaptation. Um, but that, again, I just want to say, doesn't mean that I believe that all outputs of that adaptation uh, produce are, are adaptive. I mean, again, I think almost every emotion produces maladaptive or harmful effects under certain circumstances. Uh, I don't know if, if Randy would agree uh, on that or not. I'm going to ask him, because okay. I, I feel an obligation to let him have a chance to come back at you, so go ahead. So the missing middle of this is whether normal mechanisms can give rise to a lot of useless anxiety and depression. Uh, I talk about something called the smoke detector principle. We all put up with smoke detectors that have false alarms because a false alarm is cheap, um, and not having an alarm when there's a big fire can be fatal. And so the system is set that way. Likewise, our brains are set that way. So there's a whole lot of very painful responses that are useless but normal. Mary Ann, do you want to break the tie here? Um, <laughs> I don't know if I can, because for me, one of the issues is how we're defining depression, obviously. So um, from my understanding, when we talk about 
more to do with low mood and uh, smaller, shorter term bouts of depression, I would view that more as um, just part of our, our daily human experience. So it, just like another emotion, it's just an adaptation to our situation. Failing to recognize that something is causing you harm or is interfering in your relationships and so on um, would have dramatic and, and really negative costs to you in, in terms of evolutionary history. Um, at the same time, I think, especially within um, longer term depression or other situations, there could be more at play, especially biologically. So I don't really have a tiebreaker uh, addition <laughs> here. So sorry about that, but I, I really think that it comes down to how we're thinking about depression. Well, you can't blame me for trying to stir up a little trouble here, can you? <laughs> there we go. Great. Let me quote the science writer Robert Wright, who said, evolutionary psychology reminds us that we were not designed by natural selection to be enduringly happy or contented. Okay, that's the quote. Is one of the big takeaways here that evolution really doesn't give a darn about our happiness? Randolph, what do you say? Absolutely, and it's so sad, but we should pause here. It's a miracle and wonderful that so many people can be pretty happy much of the time. I mean, we should just pause and just thank, be thankful uh, that that's actually possible. If we watched, I would say mostly American, but occasionally Canadian cable television, we would never come away with that impression. So you sure you want to stick with that? I'll stick with it. Yes, indeed. Okay. Just if, see your friends instead of TV. That's it. <laughs> Marianne, you want to uh, follow up on that? That was great, Randy. Um, you know, I, I view uh, I view people basically as strategists and opportunists. And, uh, you know, we're all striving to be happy. We're all striving for what's best for ourselves, you know, to some degree and best for our family and maybe best for our kins and, and uh, allies and friends and so on. But evolution itself doesn't care, I feel. It's, it's really, um, you know, happiness, I think, is part of our evolutionary history because it's a way of signaling to us that we're doing the right thing. And we're trying to, um, we're motivated rather to try in the right approaches that will help either improve our fitness or the likelihood of our children surviving, ourselves surviving, and so on. Um, so I don't think evolution has any sort of goal that way. But I would say that it is really, as Randy pointed out, a miracle that uh, most of the time, most of us are fairly content. And that is remarkable. Hmm. Paul, we heard uh, Randolph say earlier that uh, most people who never have a sad moment in their lives end up not living very long. Do you think being content and happy all the time, is that an evolutionary disadvantage? Uh, yeah, I do. I think that our nervous system, uh, evolution has given our nervous system the capacity to feel so many different kinds of feelings, you know, uh, painful feelings. You know, you can think about all the different pain receptors that allow us to feel the pain of hot or cold or smashing objects or um, cutting objects, etc. And then with uh, our emotions, we have all sorts of painful feelings, shame, guilt, sadness, depression, anxiety, fear, uh, et cetera. They're there for reasons. Um, and, and as, you know, as Randy said, yeah, I mean, if people who uh, have lack the ability to feel pain have very short lives, and that's probably true with depression too. Depression has its place in our life. We need to figure out what it is that depression does. Um, but, the other thing that I would say is, like Randy, uh, I'm not of the opinion that just because depression might be evolved and do something uh, useful, uh, that doesn't mean uh, we should like glorify it or say that people shouldn't seek out treatment or help. But I do think that understanding whether or not depression is an evolved adaptation that uh, natural selection has given us, mm -hmm. or it's a disorder where something's going wrong in the brain, those will determine which therapy may be best uh, for, for the treating, mm. right? So understanding etiology, the cause of a condition like depression, whether it's a disorder or a normal uh, emotional state, that's crucial to how we treat. Randolph, uh, we just heard Paul say we shouldn't glorify depression, but don't we tend to do that? Don't we look back and look at the Ernest Hemingways of the world and say, my goodness, they were so magnificent and they lived am amidst all of this depression and look at what wonderful things they created. Sounds like we do glorify. 
I think we do sometimes. Yep. And, you know, we haven't mentioned bipolar disease. That's really quite a different kettle of fish than the kinds of depression we've been talking about. And it may well be the case that many people with bipolar disease do have special kinds of creativity and pay a terrible price for it. So, again, it's complicated and we need to ask people one by one to try to understand things. Hmm. Down to our last couple of minutes here, Marianne, let me put this to you. What are the practical applications of looking at depression and mental illness through this evolutionary lens? I think the the be biggest benefit is understanding that um, depression is part of who we are. And, you know, when people ask you how you're feeling and you say, oh, I'm happy, they go, great, I'm busy, great. But when you say um, I'm experiencing low mood or I'm feeling really depressed, uh, you know, if they really care, they're going to say, oh, what's going on? And if you really care about them, you would actually be honest and say you're feeling that low mood and depressed. So I think the benefit to having an ev evolutionary approach is that it teaches us that um, you know, the stigma we have in place about depression doesn't need to be there. It can be removed and it can allow us to reach out maybe more freely if we view it as part of our evolutionary heritage. It's not something that you in particular may have done within um, your own life situation that's caused it. So I think it, it might help us to uh, be a bit more free about discussing it and ha having that um, the weight of evolutionary psychology behind us to begin to unpackage what's going on for the individual. But I would like to point out that um, Randy made one really important point, I felt, and that was that, you know, we can't have these broad generalizations across individuals. And in psychology, especially, I think we're very aware that we have to have individualized forms of treatment. And I think evolutionary psychology here would be one part of that treatment or one part of that discussion. Um, and of course, we need to understand individuals a lot, a lot deeper to really have that benefit overall. Sure. Randall, practical applications of looking at this through an evolutionary lens? So actually, an article was just published two days ago by Hans Schroeder, a colleague of mine at University of Michigan, where he did a study looking at the implications of how we view our own depression. And one group of people were given the idea that depression is a brain disease and that's it. And, and other people were told it's more like what Marianne was saying and Paul was saying, that it's a part of our lives and it has functional significance. It turns out that thinking about one's own depression as you know, just a product of the brain without thinking more deeply about it makes people passive and pessimistic about their ability to get better. I'm gonna give a once, half a second, half a minute case. I once saw a sad, sad kid who had been living in his parents' basement for years, and he came in and said, we gotta do something different. I've tried seven different drugs, you have gotta find one. I said, well, what else can we talk about? He says, well, I know it's a brain disease, and I'm just waiting until find some, someone finds the right drug. I said, you got to get out of the basement, man. And he <laughs> said, no, it's a brain disease. We just have to wait. So this is a situation where I think our evolutionary framework helps people uh, to take a broader, less stigmatizing view of their own problems. Paul, last word to you on this. Yeah, well, I agree a lot with my colleagues here. Um, I'm going to come back to the idea that uh, most depression probably is a normal emotional response. Um, but uh, with all of our adaptations, with our heart or eyes or whatever, they can all malfunction at some rate. So. Um, uh, I believe that an evolutionary understanding will be better at helping us to understand uh, the normal depressed state as at a normal emotional experience. And those instances, probably much fewer, where there is something really going wrong in the brain. Uh, and once we have a good understanding of the or you know, how to dis uh, distinguish and identify the two different types, we're going to be in a much better position for uh, figuring out uh, how to treat. Again, I think uh, something like a psychotherapy really works well under a model of uh, this is a normal emotional response, whereas psycho uh, pharma uh, pharmaceutical drugs are much more uh, understandable under a disorder framework. Gotcha. That was fascinating, you three. Thank you so much for coming on to TVO tonight and having this conversation. Randolph Nessie in Brighton, Michigan, Mary Ann Fisher, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Paul Andrews of McMaster University here in our studio. All good wishes, everybody. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very so much, much, Steve. Maybe one of the very few silver-ish linings of the pandemic is that it became much easier to talk about loneliness when people were isolated and literally socially distant. And that's good because even before COVID, there was mounting concern about a loneliness epidemic. 
That was raised again recently by the American Surgeon General, who called for a national strategy there on social cohesion and connection. With us on what they're seeing here and how to tackle loneliness, we're joined by Pete Bombacci. He is founder and executive director of the not-for-profit GenWell Project that aims to be a Canadian-led global human connection movement. David Kepis is here, CEO of Companion Link, a registered charity that connects isolated people, particularly seniors, with volunteers for social connection. Miriam Amder, founder of the 52 Friends Project, which is on a mission to reduce the stigma around loneliness and prioritize friendship. And Steve Jordans, professor of psychology at the University of Toronto Scarborough. And it is great to have all of you around our table tonight for what is sadly a very timely discussion. And I want to set it up, if I can, with uh, the following graphic. Sheldon, why don't you bring these numbers up and I'll read along for those listening on podcast at home. How lonely are we? We ask the question. 60% of Canadians are feeling somewhat or much lonelier since the start of the pandemic. 60%. 40% of Canadians say they want to have more friends. 77% of people who have poor self-rated physical health are also lonely. There's a connection there. Let's do some more. Gen Z or Z, depending on how you want to pronounce it, mid-teens to 24, that's the loneliest generation today compared to all the older generational cohorts. Those who greeted strangers at least once a week were almost three times more likely to be happy. All of this data, incidentally, from the Canadian Social Connection Survey from the year 2021. All right, let's find out about what all of you do. David, Companion Link is what? So Companion Link <clears throat> is a charity that matches volunteers one-on-one -on -one with socially isolated seniors. And at its absolute core concept is the goal to just make a friend. Um, you can't put a value on the feeling of being valued and to have someone who knows your name, who wants to hear from you, who wants to pay attention to you. Um, and it's something that, as you just noted, we are all, but certainly from my perspective, seniors in particular are lacking today. 52 friends is what? <laughs> So beginning in October of 2022, I made it my goal to make one friend a week. I was experiencing a period of loneliness and I thought that the way, I thought that a way for me to help with that is to meet one friend a week and to document it. And I realized that a lot of other people are struggling with loneliness, especially people my age. I'm 25, so I think that that's kind of a point in our lives when we move from our childhood friends to our adult friends and that can be difficult for a lot of people. And so I made it, I started 52 Friends with the goal to raise awareness around the loneliness stigma, because I think that a lot of the times we see loneliness as a weakness when it shouldn't be. And also to encourage us all to prioritize friendship because friendship is really an important part of our social health and we often put it on the back burner. It's a neat idea, one friend a week. Where did that come to you from? <laughs> I really like meeting people and documenting stories and meeting strangers. So I think that I thought that would be a cool way to do it. And it made me more comfortable meeting people. I think it gave me this platform where I could easily reach out to someone and say I'm working on this project and document it that way. Great. Pete, GenWell is what? Uh, GenWell is a human connection movement. We're Canada's human connection movement. And our mission is to make the world a happier and healthier place by educating, empowering, and catalyzing Canadians around the importance of face-to-face -face social connection for their health, their happiness, their longevity, and for the betterment of society. And we do that both on a, on a national scale through daily postings of tips, tools, ideas, and research on our social channels and website, but we also work in workplaces, in classrooms, in communities, educating people about the importance of their social health, which has a positive impact on their mental and physical health. Well, I can tell you all, and our viewers and listeners as well, that the catalyst for the program you're on right now is this guy sitting right here, <laughs> who's been a guest on our program many times in the past, but you thought this was a particularly good time to revisit this issue. How come? Yeah, well, I mean, during the pandemic, I was, I was trying to find ways to help. And, and I knew everybody was very anxious, so I, I created a free course to help people understand anxiety and manage it. But I was also routinely in the media um, giving tips and suggestions about what people should do. And, and one of those tips and suggestions, a big one, is social connection. Uh, the research is just so clear on how powerful a tool this is, literally to bring people happiness, to help their physical health, 
health, to help their social health. Well, it is their social health, sorry, their mental health. <laughs> um, those three things we can kind of consider all tied together and the social health really feeds the other two. So I'm sort of coming at it from a scientific perspective. What scientists really need are people that are taking this data and mobilizing it and, and bringing it to the people that, that need it. And all three of these people became heroes to me. I, I was sort of, during the pandemic, I've been looking for heroes um, and I've been finding them. And so any chance to work with them and to support what they're doing, I'm there 100%. We know that during the pandemic, it was a really, really tough and you might even say awful time for so yep. many people in terms of human connection. Now that the pandemic is, I don't want to say over, but shall we say more manageable, more mm -hmm. under control, are we coming out of that? Well, I mean, there, there's a bit of a hangover, a bit of a shadow, I think. I mean, it was a long enough period of time that people have sort of restructured habits a little bit. There's the, also the potential of fear that's come out of the pandemic. We associate a lot of anxiety with close proximity to other people and such. And so, you know, I think it was an issue, and Pete can tell you this well, before the pandemic already, but I think the pandemic has just sort of exacerbated it more, and especially, as you suggested, for those younger uh, people who are, who are, I think, really struggling now. Do, do you see that, Pete? Because I've got to tell you, I I do notice, as odd as this sounds, many people I bump into have kind of forgotten how to have face-to-face -face contact. They've spent so much time on their devices over the pandemic, they've lost the, uh, the, the skill of interpersonal connection. You well, see I, that? I think we can see this just when we think about not going to the gym for a period of time. And what's it like when we go back to the gym that first time? It's not so easy. And so I think what we're seeing is people have gotten set in new ways, you know, whether that's uh, binge watching TV, whether that's on your digital technology, whatever the other solutions were to help us cope with two years of being masked up and locked down. Now we actually have to help people. And this is really what the movement's all about, which is the solution to our, our disconnected world should not be a medical one where we wait until people are lonely or sick before we try to help. It's about awakening all Canadians, 38 million of us, to say, hey, you can be part of the solution. And it starts with saying hello to a neighbor, saying hello to somebody that you walk by as a stranger, is talking to old friends, to old colleagues. We can all be part of the solution. But I think the first step is educating people just on how important this is, which research now says it's more important than exercise and as important as eating well. Have you found, I mean, you're the youngest among us here, and ha have you found that some of your friends have kind of lost the skill or forgotten how to communicate with each other? I think so. I also think that happened to me, and that's why I started the project. Huh. Because we were spending all this time at home, working from home, only really talking to one another over text. And I think that we lost the ability to be able to have in-depth conversations and have quality conversations. And I've noticed that among my friends, and I think that's why our friendships have weakened, is because we lost the skill, and then we, we start to think that we don't need to, to work on it, that we just become comfortable with the way that we're living. And now I gotta ask you how we get out of it because, uh, and, and I assume, well, let me play a little gender politics here. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you think it's a great idea that we should all go out and try and meet a new friend a week and, and the, the, the health benefits that will come from that. But there are obviously, uh, there will be women who are watching this right now who will say to themselves, I'm not really comfortable with the idea of a guy who I don't know just sort of getting in my personal space and saying hi to me in public. Uh, I know they think they're being friendly, but you know, we live in a different era nowadays. How do we figure all that out? I think that you need to have tact in all of your interactions. <laughs> so just important to, to think like what I want, just, just be tactful, I think, and be mindful of other people's space. I think we can usually feel when someone wants us to come up to them or not. So think of the environment that you're in. If you're at a networking event, you probably don't mind if people are coming up to you if you're at, if you're talking to your neighbor, you probably don't mind if he comes up to you. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's if it's out of the blue and you're walking down the street with your groceries and someone's on the phone with you and some then someone walks up to you, maybe you won't appreciate that. No, <laughs> I, I get that. And Steve, let me get some help from you on this as well, because one of the suggestions that I've read about is that you should say, say hi to a stranger, you know, when you're walking down the street, just say hello. Now, some people are going to be a little put off by that. So how do we handle all this? Yeah, I mean, the, the research is kind of interesting. So the research suggests that most of us, if, if we're asked, 
would, what's going to happen if you go talk to a stranger? We think it's going to end horribly. We have what's called a fear of negative evaluation. We think they're not going to like us. They're not going to whatever. Um, when you actually look at the experiments and the data, when you make that connection, at least 90% of the time it goes well. Um, and, and the people feel very positively from it. We don't worry about the 90. We worry about the 10. We worry about the 10. And, and that is, you know, in this story, we, we say, hey, there's this happy solution. We just need to do good, better social connection. Um, but there's a villain in the story, and that villain is social anxiety. And, and and in fact, you know, we talk about young people losing the skill. It's unclear whether they ever developed it to the same extent where you and I did, because they've been communicating through social media for a long time. Mm. Social, media, social media does not give head nods, yeah. does not give, you know, all the nonverbals that, that when Miriam talks about having tact, you know, we have to be able to read those signs to feel comfortable in a conversation. And I think a lot of young people were not given as much practice. Uh, and so they, they find it even pre-pandemic, people coming to my office hours would say, this is really, you know, it stresses me out, you're intimidating. Mm. That'd be mm. me. But to that generation, they feel this is a real challenge. David, you may have started your program dealing with senior population. Mm -hmm. How about younger people? Are they involved in your efforts as well? You know, that was actually one of the biggest shifts for us about a year into our organization. I mean, we remain focused on reducing isolation among seniors, mm -hmm. but the benefit to the volunteer, and, and we work with so many people who are, you know, at, at sort of the student age or, or in their 20s or early 30s, um, what they can learn and what they can benefit from interacting with someone who's from a different generation is, is absolutely extraordinary. I have spoken with, I'd say, probably every single one of our volunteers, and I always ask them, you know, what, why do you want to work with seniors? And many of them um, come from, uh, our overwhelming majority of, of uh, volunteers are women, and I'd say the majority are uh, women of color from Southeast Asian or Asian backgrounds, and, and they will say to me, well, I grew up in an environment where there was a much more, there was a greater role for elderly or seniors. There was a more multi-generational setting. And it's actually bizarre to me not to have this in my life. And I would love to volunteer and make those connections. Um, and that tells you, I think, everything you need to know about what the benefit as a young person of making that connection can be. Steve, what if you're a lone wolf? What if you're a deeply introverted person and the notion of that kind of contact with strangers is just... Yeah. Absolutely outside your comfort zone. I, I mean, our, our notion of introverted, extroverted is often like how much do you crave, you know, rich social interactions. Mm -hmm. But if it gets down to how much do you need some close social interactions when the chips get down, and this is where social connection really pays off. When we're under a lot of stress, when, when the world is being tough on us, these close connections we have allow us to sort of dissipate that, to share the stress and to feel like somebody is there and somebody cares. And even your deepest introvert needs somebody there who cares. Um, when you lose that, that's when you really feel totally, totally isolated. So, you know, it's true they may not crave as much social interaction as somebody else, but they certainly need it as badly as everybody. When did you start 52 Friends? I started 52 Friends end of October. End of October, October of last year. Yeah. So you're not, okay, so you're, you're a little more than halfway through? I'm at friend number 30. You're at 30, okay, yeah. so that makes sense. Uh, of your efforts to make new friends, how many of the, how many times have gone well? How many times have not gone well? I think it's gone well in my case because because I think I'm tactful and because I reach mm -hmm. out to people who who I may have lost touch with or people who run in similar social circles. So I think that I've been tactful and intentional in the people that I reach out to. But I also know that there's this idea that. I, I'm collecting friends, and I don't think that's true. I think that we only re the research shows we only really can have three to five close friends and one to two what they call soulmates. So soulmates mm -hmm. is someone you can text and say, I just had coffee, or I'm going to the grocery store. And so we don't need 52 friends, but it's really nice to be able to expand our social circles and be vulnerable and practice reaching out to people. Well, that's the thing. Most, oh, I don't know if I can use this word, normal? Most normal people fear rejection mm -hmm. when they reach out in the kind of way you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Do you not? No, I also think it's like the, the more times you do something, you increase your chances of being successful. Hmm. So maybe I'll ask 10 people and one person will say no, but I'll, nine people will say yes. So I'm not going to focus on the one person who said no. That's the 90-10 theory. There we go. <laughs> Well, and I also, I think Miriam's called something out a couple times, and it's a part of everything that David's doing, Miriam's doing, and we're doing at the Genwell Project, is giving people permission. 
So Miriam has her project, which allows her the confidence to say, I'm going to reach out to you because I'm doing this project for 52 Friends. David has it because I'm reaching out because I'm part of this program that's trying to build a more connected senior in Canada. Well, if we all can create, and this is what the Genwell project, we're educating people, but also throughout the course of the year, we have Genwell weekends, we have Loneliness Awareness Week, we have a lot of catalytic moments that give people permission to say, you know what, today, Steve, you could talk to your neighbor that you haven't spoken to before, mm -hmm. or you might try talking to a stranger, because sometimes we need that little boost that says, okay, it's like St. Patrick's Day, I wear green every year. and I have some Irish blood in me, but the rest of the year I don't wear green. Why is it one day of the year I'll put on silly hats, wear green, put buttons on and drink green beer? Because somebody gave me permission to do it. And that's what Genwell is trying to do, is create that permission so that people understand why and then give them the opportunity to make it happen. Steve, if I, if I may add as well, I think that there's maybe a myth about what a socially isolated person might look like, mm. that you know, they have nobody in their lives, you know, they're only at home. But I think you know, to, to Steve's point about perhaps the degradation of the way that we interact caused by social media, you know, their loneliness can look very, very different. I think about, I had a, uh, a senior reach out to us, to us back in December, self-identifying as, you know, I am completely isolated. I would love to be part of your program. And I called her the next day and, you know, we, we got to chatting. She has family, um, you know, she has kids. Now they don't live in Canada anymore, but they, you know, they call her occasionally. Um, she had a very successful career. You know, I, I got off that phone call thinking, you know, my goodness, like this person sort of quote unquote did everything right. Um, and yet they still had the courage, which many people don't, to say, I need more than this. You know, mm -hmm. I need more friends. So, you know, to the point about the richness of having that network and being able to engage with strangers and building that out, it is so important, even if you might think, well, you know, I have a couple of people. It can be more than that and oftentimes must be. Can I follow up with you on that? Of course. Did, did she, was she able to tell her family that yes, you FaceTime me every couple of weeks, but that's not enough? You know what? I haven't asked her if what her comfort level would be with reaching out to, to her kids to ask them to do more, but I, I can tell you as a, as a son, as a grandson, I think I certainly feel this way, I'm sure a lot of people do, you can always do more. You can always be calling your, you know, your mom, your your grandfather, your the the folks in your um, in your neighborhood. I like one of the things that I would love to to share with with people watching this program is so much of what you can do to combat isolation and loneliness can start at home um, and can simply be reaching out to those loved ones in your network or in your community. Um, and we definitely can can do more. We should, I think, make the distinction, Steve, here between being alone and being lonely. Mm -hmm. Solitude versus isolation and loneliness. Right. What's the difference? Right. I mean, solitude can be very beneficial. There's a lot of people who find when they spend some time just by themselves, you get away from everything, you get the good thoughts, the good deep reflections. You know, sometimes life-changing moments happen when we're in that deep solitary reflection. Loneliness is more like hunger. Um, it, it literally is, is our body telling us there's something we need. We need that social connection. Um, and the normal response to loneliness is to go out and, and, and do something. It's just we've sort of created a world now where people find that a very difficult step. And one of the things I love about what, what all of these people are doing is there's the awareness that this is important. That's hard first because our, co our conscious mind doesn't always understand the importance of the emotional connections that we have. So we have to kind of convince people through the data, no, no, this will work. But then we need to give them the practice because they have difficulty really learning how do I reach out to somebody? And, and there are easy tips. You know, I will mention one thing now, which is just something called active listening. If you think, ah, how do I have a conversation? Go check out active listening on the web. Basically become a reporter, almost like yourself, Steve, where you, where you get good at just asking people more questions about their life. And we love that. We love people who are interested in us. And it's very easy to start a conversation in that kind of mode, find the points of connection and then take it from there. And so it's kind of like, you can get out of this. There's that anxiety, but we can get you by, by the anxiety and bring you to that more comfortable place. Miriam, this notion of alone versus lonely, have you experienced this? Definitely. I think that we need to learn to be alone and that being alone can be really beneficial. Mm -hmm. I also think that sometimes when we're struggling, 
we have this idea that we need to separate ourselves from everyone and just suffer by ourselves. When we can learn how, how to be alone, if within the context of other people, we can only discover ourselves within the context of other people, is what I mean. Mm. And then so once we learn how to be with people, we can we need to learn. How, we can learn how to do both at the same time. Is what I'm trying to say. Is you can also enjoy your time alone, enjoy your solitude, and enjoy your time in relationships. Right. All right. In our remaining moments here, let me just take everybody down the road. If we all follow your advice, let's say we all just take that extra step. We make that effort to talk to that stranger. We try to make some new friends. We try to stay in touch with our senior relatives and so on. Steve, take us five years down the road. What does society look like? I, I mean, we, we know how polarized society is right now, and that's caused by a lack of trust, a feeling that that person is other, different, etc. What social connection does is tear that all down. Um, it literally, the more we interact with others, the more we understand them, uh, the less we fear them, uh, and the better we're able to have good communications with them. So, you know, a lot of the things that we all gnash our teeth at when we look at society today, this is the path to making it better. Pete, what does our society look like five years down the road if we do more of what you suggest? Even as you asked the question, Steve, I got, uh, I became happier. I became motivated because I'm, the aspiration is to do just that. And what I think it creates is happier, healthier individuals, workplaces, communities, streets, homes, um, classrooms, and everybody starts to feel a greater sense of connection. And we know that the research says that when you have that sense of support and that sense of belonging in your whatever that group is, that you are happier and healthier, and over time, that will affect all of us. So I think it's an, a beautiful aspiration, and I think we can make the world a happier and healthier place. David, I happened to be in on a Zoom call yesterday with the former United Kingdom minister responsible for loneliness. Mm. You know, they appointed one mm -hmm. in the recent government. And she said, being lonely is as adverse to your health as if you smoked 15 cigarettes a day. Yes. So take us down the road. What does a better society look like? Yeah, I mean, and, and I apologize for perhaps being the, the pessimist on the panel. I mean, the, the <laughs> scale and scope of, of the problem is, is quite dire. I mean, if you look between, say, 2015 to 2035, as a percentage of the population, people older than 65 will go from about one in six to one in four. And if you are socially isolated at, 60, at 65, you can expect to live about three to five years fewer than somebody who has a, a nourishing social life. One of the things that we say at Companion Link is, you know, let's let's give those years back. Um, I absolutely adore all the initiatives and work that everybody around this table are doing, um, but I, I so fear that the steps that we're taking, you know, we, we need to go much further to address that, that problem because the scale is truly enormous. We got 20 seconds left for you to tell us where you're going to find your next 22 friends. <laughs> <laughs> I think that kind of playing off of what we're just talking about is we need to be a friendlier collective. And I think when we're a friendlier collective, it's easier to make friends. Perfect. So that's how I'm going to find them. <laughs> that's great. I want to thank all of you for coming onto our program tonight, starting here on the right side of the table, David Kepis and Miriam Amder, and on the other side of the table, Pete Bombacci and Steve Jordans. Uh, really important, timely conversation. Thanks for coming in tonight, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Steve. <laughs>